Beetlejuice has a diameter of 260 million miles. If you and I were to live on that orb and had the same ratio in stature, how big would you and I be on that planet? Well, let's consider it. Here's the size of the star. Here's the orbit of the Earth around our Sun. And the size of Jupiter's orbit. So can you see the comparison? Now, let me just show you another comparison. Here's the planet Earth in comparison to Venus and Mars and Mercury and Pluto. Can you see that? Now, here is the Earth in comparison to Uranus, Neptune, Saturn, and Jupiter. And you can see how small Pluto's have become. But if we continue to compare, here's the Earth in comparison to our Sun. But we haven't arrived at Betelgeuse yet. Here's the Sun in comparison to Arcturus. But, here's Arcturus in comparison to Betelgeuse. And where's our sun? It disappears. So, how big is it? Or maybe we should say, how small are we? Which one? Let me just give you a, a sense of, as to what we're talking about. This is how big you'd be on planet Earth. This is how big you'd be on Betelgeuse. Now, just to put this in perspective, let's put some measurements. The length of your calf would be nine and a half miles long. The length of your leg would be 18 and a half miles long. The length of your index finger would be 11,000 feet. The circumference of your forearm would be 8 miles, your chest would be 138,000 feet, and you would be 37 and a half miles high. All this speaks of omnipotence, telling us how big God is and how small we are. Now, the most stupendous an amazing fact of all concerning the constellation of Orion. Again, notice the night sky. Can you see the stars? The three stars here, and one here, and the three here. Can you see that? Right in the middle spot of the belt, can you see that? Okay. Is something which has modern astronomers sit back with awe. For this middle fussy appearing star is not really a simple star, but it is in fact a gigantic nebula called the Nebula of Orion. Here's a polymoscope close-up view of the nebula. Astronomers, as they look at this nebula, say, isn't there some vast mystery there? Why? Because as we examine this spot with our modern telescopes, we find that this is the brightest, most brilliantly colored spot in all of God's universe. Why should this spot be more brilliant than all others? Could there be some reason for this fact? How is this mystery explained? Dr. Larkin of Lowe Observatory said, that in the midst of the nebula is a gigantic cavern, a cave which is 19 trillion miles across and 53 trillion miles deep. So large that as we consider the size of the orbit of our world around the sun, we could place 90,000 such orbits in a straight line in order to go across the mouth of this cave. And I said 90, 90,000 of our orbits. Now listen, 
No matter where we turn our telescopes into the sky, we see millions of stars. But here is a many-colored gigantic cave, open with no stars, empty apparently, beautiful beyond description. It is called by astronomers the open space in Orion. Again, why is this the only empty spot in the sky? Why is it so brilliantly colored, so beautiful? Listen to what Dr. Larkin of Mount Observatory, uh, Low Observatory says. What has all along appeared to be a flat surface of nebulous matter in the sort of Orion is shown to be the mouth of a cavern, a deep opening receding into the mighty distance beyond. It is like looking in at a door into the rear of the cave, deep within glittering nebulosity. The chasm is the most beautiful object visible to human sight. Pillars, columns, walls, facades, bulwarks, stalactites and stalagmites are within deeps of deeps. They glow and shine superbly with pearly light. The distance of the rear of the chasm from the opening cannot be measured but it must be three times greater in depth than width, or 51 trillion miles. Sirius and Centurii, following with fine ample room within this cosmic deep, torn, twisted, and distorted masses of shining gaseous matter, adorned with myriads of glittering points, and the whole forms a scene of indescribable magnificence. This titan mass of pearly light, whence is origin? If it is a cold light, like uh, luminosity not due to heat, such as in the case of the firefly, then the mystery is beyond any solution in the present power of science. If due to heat, the quantity of heat must be as that of millions of white hot suns. I have traveled to many parts of the world and have gone to many caves. Rotorua there in the New Zealand, the great uh, caverns of the Carlsbad Caverns, the ca salt mines in Poland. I've seen many beautiful caves, many beautiful things, but they do not compare to the cave in heaven. When you compare God's great cave of the universe with its gorgeous beauty that defies description, you can understand why scientists are awestruck. Garrett Service said, is there not some vast mystery concealed in that part of the heavens? To me at least, it seems so. For I can never shake off the impression that the creative power which made the universe lavishes richest gifts upon the locality in and surrounding Orion. Did the great creator outdo himself in this particular area? The great poet Tennyson wrote a single misty star which is the second in the line of stars that seems a sword beneath a belt of three. I never gazed upon it, but I dream of some vast charm concluded in that star would make all worldly things seem as nothing. I wonder what inspired him to write that. Spurgeon, the great expository preacher, said this. In the heavens, God floats out his starry flag to show that the king is at home and hangs out his banner in order that atheists may see that he despises the denunciation of him. Then he wrote, he who looks up into the heavens 
and then brands himself an atheist is at the same time an idiot and a liar. That was Persian. The Bible says truly, the scripture declares the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And that's Psalms 14 verse 1. I was reading a book one time written over uh, almost 200 years ago, a time when the scientists had uh, no knowledge of the glories of the open space of Orion, a time when there was no telescope of any significance to understand the riddle of these questions. And as I read this statement, it said, the Lord gave me a view of the shaking of the powers of the heavens. Dark, heavy clouds came up and clashed against each other. The atmosphere parted and rolled back, and then we could look up through the open space in Orion, whence came the voice of God. The holy city will come down through that open space. Now think about it. How did this lady who wrote this statement, Ellen White, know in the year 1848, a time when there were no scopes of significant size, a time when scientists were completely ignorant of the fact that there was an open space in Orion. To understand the difficulty of making such a statement, one should examine the heavens on a clear night and determine whether an open space a gigantic cave can be located in the heavens. Such would be impossible to detect with the naked eye. A power beyond the human was needed in 1848 to reveal an open space in Orion. What do you say? But listen, Ellen White saw and heard more. She heard the voice of God coming from the open space and saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, ascending to this earth through the open space. Could it be that tonight we have located the throne of God in the heavens of heaven, where the new Jerusalem, the holy city, awaits the saints of God? If so, no wonder that the open space in Orion is so intensely bright. Most brilliant spot in the universe. And what's interesting is that scientists are noticing that it is getting brighter. The glory of God, more radiant than human eyes can look upon, is shining through. The redeemed, transform, and change, according to the scriptures, will pass through the opening and enter the city of God. I don't know how many of you remember this promise. Can we read it together? Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. What a wonderful promise. What do you say? According to the scriptures then, Jesus has promised that he will come again. And at his coming, as he descends from the heavens, Revelation chapter 19 reveals that the armies of heaven come on white horses down to this earth. The greatest rescue mission ever undertaken in all the universe will then be taking place.